Well, good morning. Good morning. Very, uh, very glad to be here. I'm actually uh, excited in a couple of ways. Not only have both my sons uh, gone to this school, Kyle and Luke, uh, Nancy and I are big believers in Denver Academy and I just love what you all do here. In fact, we're continually uh, amazed and inspired by what you do. What I'm going to give you today is, is really got elements of several of my favorite talks. And I'm going to talk about relationships in terms of uh, romantic and sexual relationships. I'm going to apply a lot of what I'm going to focus on to teen relationships, although I tend to study research-wise people more in their 20s, but you'll see how things apply to, to the folks that you're all do, uh, dealing with. I also want you to notice as we go on that the things I'm going to talk about in terms of commitment and how commitment either forms forms or doesn't form or fails to form properly for life's pursuits uh, affects everything. So everything I'm going to talk about, I will all be focusing content-wise on relationships. Everything I will say, you could apply to commitment in virtually any stream of life. Any major pursuit, anything that's important to us in life, you could apply the things that I'll be talking about. I want to start with a quote from a colleague of mine, Marlene Pearson. Uh, she and I and others have uh, written different curricula for, in this case, curricula for individuals about making better choices in their relationship. Uh, Marlene is one of the most passionate teachers you could ever find. She teaches at a uh, uh, technical college in Madison, Wisconsin. And one of the things that she is passionate about with youth is she wants them to understand how what they do in their love lives affects everything else that they're going to do in life in terms of their opportunities or their lack of opportunities and their success. And she brings this down into a one-liner. Your love life is not neutral. What people do with their love lives, especially teenagers, especially people in their early 20s, sets a course for whether they're going to succeed or fail in a million other ways in life. In fact, school achievement, work, economic opportunities, relationship success, marriage, family, so much is set in motion early on, which makes it uh, of some concern how things happen. Now, I want to lay a few things foundationally down about the idea of commitment and the way I'll be thinking about commitment. Uh, in portions of this talk because then I'm going to use these concepts as we continue on uh, through the material I want to present today. One of the things you can think about when you think about commitment is it's fundamentally always making a choice to give up other choices. That's what commitment really is. If you want a one-liner and then I can give you books and chapters and much more than one line but if you had to put it in one line when you're making a commitment to something you're choosing something over other things and and you're planning to pursue that one and not the other things that you chose. So commitment's making a choice to give up other choices and therein lies, you can imagine, a dilemma for our culture where we're really encouraged consistently to hang on to all of our options, which is kind of anti-commitment because the deeper passionate life is really about making choices among the opportunities and then really pursuing the ones that matter to us most. So commitment's fundamentally about choosing something or someone for the future, so there's always a future orientation when you talk and think about commitment. Two other terms that I'll use a lot as I talk. One is uh, personal dedication and the other is constraint. Dedication speaks to the aspect of commitment when you think about somebody really being intrinsically motivated or interested in something, they're dedicated. Boy, he sure is passionate about teaching. Philippe Ernawine is very passionate about teaching. My colleague Marlene Pearson is passionate about teaching, passionate about young people. That's dedication. Constraints and other element of commitment that we all experience routinely, which is more the sense, I've got to keep going this direction because I've already started down this path. So for example, let's give a college example. Someone might choose uh, not too carefully early in college to be in a particular major. Let's say they choose psychology. This actually doesn't apply to me, but uh, I'll, I'll use it because uh, you can kind of see where this example is going. Uh, the further the person goes, let's say, let's say I initially choose psychology out of dedication. Uh, and then the further I go, the less interested, the less passionate, I'm not connected to it so dedication-wise. And finally, it's the middle of my senior year, and I've gotten all my credits done for psychology. I'm not even remotely started 
on any other kind of major, but I don't want to do psychology anymore. I'm constrained now. I could go to college for three more years and redecide, but the inertia of what I've already done is now going to affect me and propel me to continue on that path, whether or not I want to continue on that path. Now, a lot of times in life, constraints are actually positive. They help keep us on uh, the path that we chose when we're not so wild about it on a given day, but you can imagine if that's all that keeps us on a path over time, it's not a, a great life because it's dedication that really leads to the higher quality kind of life and is consistent with a sense of passion. So uh, I have the, uh, the choice point here in terms of the little diagram shown just to make the point that when I choose path A, I'm not choosing path B, and part of the constraints of path A is that I'm no longer going to find it as easy to get onto path B. I could get over to path B if I really wanted to, but there's things about going further down path A that make it harder to switch. If you want a simple summary of these two ideas, essentially dedication is much more related to the want to and constraint is much more related to the have to. Now, uh, commitments needed in many important pursuits in life like romantic relationships, marriage, education, career goals, personal care, self-care, health care, um, exercising, diet, all those kinds of things. Uh, commitments necessary because it's not always fun to do any of the things that we chose to do or that we really committed ourselves to do. That is the appropriate emotional response. Let's try it as a group. Aww. This is our dog, Odie. Uh, this is a picture taken the very first night we brought Odie home when he was a four pound little ball of fluff. He's now an 18 pound behemoth that terrorizes our neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> you can imagine just how scary he's become as he got larger. <laughs> Now I could give uh, I could give like a two-hour talk just around the theme of Odie, but I'll just uh, make a, a quick point about Odie. Uh, we were very deliberate, especially Nancy, my wife, was very deliberate in choosing Odie. We wanted a dog that was hypoallergenic, which has you know hair and not fur, and one of those ones that you know isn't going to cause uh, allergies in our home and, and, and shedding and kinds of things like that. Uh, wanted other kinds of characteristics, and Nancy figured all that out, and we, we wanted this kind of dog and looked around looked around Nancy looked at different breeders Nancy looked in different places and finally actually found uh, Odie at a, a pet store uh, it was like our last place we went looking but we saw this little face looking at us through the wire cage and what do you want to do when you see that little face you want to take him home Okay. Now, here's a great point you can make with your teenagers that you're working with. Uh, some of you might apply this to your own life if you're sort of actively searching for a partner. Uh, and the point is simply this, and, and it's, it's something to note. You fall in love with the front end of the puppy. Okay. <laughs> You fall in love with the front end of the puppy, but what is true? Every puppy has a back end. Okay? Now, you can have big dogs, you can have little dogs, you can have big puppies, you can have little puppies, but they just all have a back end. And a lot of how it works out with a particular choice is going to be how we manage that back end. And part of managing the back end well is being committed to really work that stuff through to where it's not a chronic issue and a problem. So a good thing to remind people of that, yeah, sure, it looks cute in the store, but it does have a back end. So how committed might you be to working with that back end? Again. Now, I have uh, been coming to believe that there's kind of a crisis in relationship commitment, uh, especially for younger folks. As I get older, it's real easy to think about a lot of people being younger, but I'm really thinking about people in their teens, 20s, and really up into the mid-30s now. Not that it can go beyond that, but that's the group that a lot of us that do this kind of research are very focused on. Uh, and one of the things that contributes to a crisis of commitment in terms of relationships is the fact that we just live in a culture that not only sends out this message routinely that we should hang on to all of our options, we have a billion options. There is a continual sense in an affluent culture like we live in that we have a lot of options, a lot of choices, and there's research that's very clear uh, that when people have a lot of choices or a sense that they have a lot of options, they have more trouble picking anything. 
they have more trouble picking one. So for example, if you happen to go to the county fair and you wanted to sell different kinds of jelly, you would sell a lot more if you put out three flavors instead of 30 flavors. In fact, you look at the research, it's, it's almost amazing to imagine how Baskin Robbins actually succeeded uh, because people get overwhelmed with their options. And so you combine that with the cultural message that you shouldn't give up any options and choosing becomes very difficult. An area that I'm really interested in right now, though this isn't the main focus of this talk, but I think more and more about this theoretically, is if you watch what young people are doing now in their relationships, and this is especially compared to my generation, uh, I graduated from high school in 1974, so that'll give you just a sense of where I'm at generationally. A lot of social observers, uh, social scientists and also social historians have noticed that what's true about young relationships relationships now, teens, 20s, etc., is things are so much less defined than they used to be. Uh, when I was in high school, people did things like they went steady. They, uh, you might give a class ring to a girl, which indicated you were like super steady, right? Uh, there were friendship rings. Uh, this is a little before my era, but in college there were things like getting pinned and things like this. There were all these sort of symbolic emblems of stages of commitment or things that sort of told you where this relationship was at, which probably had a number of protective functions. One is uh, when there's an external emblem like that of what your commitment is in a relationship, it's very hard for the two partners to get it wrong. It's very hard to get the kind of mismatches. The book, He's Just Not That Into You, wouldn't have been written when I was in high school, okay? Because you could read it much more, you don't want to go steady with me? You're not giving me a class ring? You know quickly where you're at. Youth now are sort of floundering in sort of a mix of things not being very clear. Um I'm actually giving sort of part of the next point as well as this one at the same time. And so they're not having this sort of societal structures as much as we used to that define relationships. And they're also, it seems to a number of us, motivated to actually not have it be clear. So it's not just that the society has sort of pulled away various sort of structures that people used to use to make uh, things clear in relationships about where they were and where they were headed. It actually also seems like younger folks are motivated for it to be this way. Uh, the interesting sort of example of something that runs counter to this trend in terms of a lack of clarity is things like MySpace and Facebook where uh, people can indicate their relationship status within that social networking. That's the first thing to sort of emerge to replace some of these things in a long time. Now why would people want to keep it fuzzy instead of keeping it real? Uh, let's go inside psychologically for a second before I move on. We're at a point now where young people are so extremely aware of the likelihood of marriages not making it. And a first time new marriage starting out today still has about a 45% chance of not making it till death do us part. And the other 55% are not going to be deliriously happy all the time. Okay? <laughs> just, just to be clear. Because uh, again, every puppy has a back end, right? Just, okay, it's just gotta hang on to that. Uh, there's no total all the time front end of the puppy marriages out there that are really solid good marriages. Now, uh, so, so here's the thing. Uh, and, and the other huge trend now that's really affecting uh, the generation to come after the ones that you're all focused on right now in terms of the high schoolers is people not marrying at all in the first place, or at least the parents of a particular child never marrying in the first place. Uh, and all of these things leave people as they grow up with a con uh, an increased sense that relationships are very fragile and attachments are insecure. And I think to to put this really simply, because I, again I could talk for hours about this one as well, I think what young people are doing now is they're preferring ambiguity because there's almost this very simplistic bargain that isn't going to actually work so well, but the bargain looks like this. If we never make it really that clear that this relationship exists, it's not going to hurt as much when it doesn't exist any longer. I don't want to define it so clearly because that's going to protect me somehow emotionally. Well, people actually get very emotionally attached and very connected whether they want to or not. The biology really feeds into that uh, in a very strong way. So it's, as, a, as a protective mechanism, it's not really likely to work very well, but I think it's part of what youth are doing now. 
Now on to this, uh, I'm going to develop this theme now for a while, this idea of sliding versus deciding that's kind of become one of my favorite phrases and things I've thought about and done over the years. It's also the name of my blog, by the way, slidingversusdeciding.com, uh, if you want to check that out. And I'm going to I'm going to work my way around to a generic risk model for relationships uh, for teens and people in their 20s, uh, and actually any stage of life. Um, but I want to do that by way of research on cohabitation, because as it turns out, research on cohabitation cohabitation is a great window on how relationships form these days and what may be going well and may be going not so well in terms of how commitment forms in relationships. I want to acknowledge my colleagues. We have. Uh, a very large federal grant studying cohabiting and uh, developing relationships uh, where we're following 1,500 people that are in the age range of 18 to 34 who are in a serious romantic relationship, asking them an unbelievable number of questions which they're kind enough to answer three times a year so that we can really follow them through various stages and steps of development in their relationship. Uh, Galena Rhodes and Howard Markman are co-investigators with me on that grant from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Now, as a researcher uh, who speaks in public fairly often, you can't get any better than something being true that is exactly in the opposite direction of what most people believe is true. That makes for a lot of fun as a social scientist because people believe something that's wrong and then you can try to engage them about why might that be wrong? What's puzzling about that? I guarantee you the number one thing that the teens that you work with believe they can do that will give them better odds in marriage is live with the person before they get married. It's the number one thing that young people believe, think that will matter, that will make a difference. Uh, and, and I'll explain a little more about why that belief might be there in the first place. The factual part of it is that no study has ever shown that. Okay, and there's decades of studies that show exactly the opposite. Uh, now the fun part gets into how do you explain that, which I'm going to actually take you through because that gets us to the sliding versus deciding part. But the, the fact is that um, at best what some studies show is it doesn't add to the risk, but most studies have shown that there's increased risk for those who live together prior to marriage in terms of things like divorce, a lower marital satisfaction, problems in communication, more common conflict in marriage. Uh, and since, by the way, just to, to show you how aware I am, I know most of you in this room would have lived together before marriage, so I'm probably making some of you a little anxious at the moment. Uh, keep this in mind. Whenever a researcher talks to you, we're always talking about average differences between groups. Okay, And that's what statistics actually help you do, is you help you figure out whether you're making too much or you're thinking there's a difference there that's not really there, that's what statistics do. There's always exceptions. When somebody says something is statistically significant, it doesn't mean that it's guaranteed that, boy, you do this and this will happen to you and you don't do that and this won't happen to you or this will happen to you. It's just moving the odds one way or the other. And when something's significant, it tells you that the odds consistently go one way or the other, but there's always exceptions. Three big explanations for this cohabitation effect among social scientists. One is, it's about the people who cohabit. And this one is absolutely very clearly true. That people who tend, especially historically, it'll be interesting as more and more people cohabit now, probably 70% of young people today are going to cohabit prior to marriage. Uh, and there's also, you know, more than that, they'll probably do variations of cohabiting that don't involve sharing a single address. Um, but it's generally historically been true that people who are more likely to cohabit versus not cohabit before marriage tend to be already at higher risk on a number of characteristics. As a researcher, you call this a selection effect. Uh, and the importance of the idea of a selection effect is it, it conveys the idea that it might not be that experience that's causing the risk. It's the risk the person already had that also made it likely that they were going to choose that experience. Everybody with me on that? That's what a selection effect is. So when it comes to cohabitation, for example, before marriage, people are more likely to cohabit before marriage if they're older, have less education, already have children, have had more sexual partners, uh, have been divorced or never married, have divorced or never married parents, experienced more conflict in their families growing up, uh, tend to have more favorable attitudes about divorce in the first place, and are less religious. 
That's a lot of stuff, and that's just probably half the list, okay? Uh, so these are things that are already true of people that are more likely not to wait until marriage to live together, and the idea of selection is that all these kinds of things are really where the risk is at, and it's not cohabiting itself. And there's a lot of merit to this theory, and the theory is generally true. The question is, how true is it? And the really interesting question, is there anything about the experience of cohabiting that relates to the risk or might add to the risk or is it all about this kind of selection effect sort of idea in terms of that group already being somewhat at greater risk on average than the group that doesn't. Now, uh, going to skip over, except for making this point by way of summary, some researchers show when you control for a lot of those kinds of variables, you can make the risk go away statistically, which makes, you know, that adds the sense of confidence that those things are really where the risk is at. On the other hand, there's a lot of studies now, so that's a pretty long list and that's not the whole list, that show that you can control for all these things and still measure and show a risk for cohabiting prior to marriage, which again says, wow, is there something about the experience that could be related to risk? So there's a couple of studies that show one interesting element related to experience, which is simply this, uh, by Axon and Thornton and Axon and Barber. People who cohabit more before they ever marry, and you could insert in more, that could be with more people or for longer periods of time, uh, what they show in those two studies is that there's an erosion over time from cohabiting of beliefs in terms of valuing marriage and also child rearing and childbearing. So the, the more people have sort of cohabited or experienced cohabiting ex uh, relationships before they ever get to marriage, the less they kind of believe in marriage once they get there. So there is some kind of erosion of beliefs and attitudes about marriage from the behavior of cohabitation over time. All right, that's all backdrop. Let's get on to our theory, which uh, is the one I really want to talk about, which is this. Uh, we call this inertia, that there's uh, inertia to cohabiting that makes it harder to break up. So here's, here's the idea. And the way I like to, to get into this is first tell you what inertia is in physics, and then I'll tell you about a finding and what that finding led to and why we study what we study in the research that we're doing. So inertia, those of you who are physics majors or just love the class, as you might recall, is the property of an object that relates to how much energy it's going to take to make it do something different than what it's doing now. Okay, so it's either at rest and you want it to start moving, inertia is related to the energy to get it to move, or it's already moving a certain direction, and if you want to get philosophical, everything is, right? Uh, it's relative, just to get Einsteinian for a second. Uh, inertia, if this is moving this way, inertia is how much energy I'm going to need to bump it this way, or move it a whole different way, or stop it and back it up 180 degrees. That's what inertia speaks to. So let me tell you a research finding. In 1996, we did a nationwide survey of married folks, uh, finally published this analysis in 2004. Uh, and one of the things that we found, uh, this is interesting, uh, at least if you're a relationship researcher geek, uh, very interesting. We looked at those who cohabited and had not cohabited prior to marriage. So among people, let's say they've been married 10 years or less, we pulled out that group within the sample because we didn't want to get sort of historical cohort effects, and looked at, well, how, what are the characteristics of these people's marriages now that they're married based on whether they lived together prior to marriage or not? Everybody with me? Those who lived together prior to marriage, particularly among the men, were less dedicated in marriage to their mate than those who had not lived with their wife, in this case, prior to marriage. So the men who lived with their wives before marriage, on average, keep in mind the on average part, because again, here's where you get zillions of exceptions, on average were less dedicated to their wives now that they're married than the guys in, who said, well, we didn't live together before marriage. Now that got me thinking a lot. I mean, really thinking a lot. Like, how could that be? I mean, what? I mean, they walked the aisle. They said, I do. They got married. How could they be less dedicated? Why didn't that, you know, why isn't their dedication in kind of a different place? 
And the idea that really came to me was very much based on this whole idea of, of the way I've thought about commitment since the 80s when I started doing research on it for my dissertation, as that idea of constraint came back in my head. So I'm measuring dedication in this study, but I started thinking about constraint and started thinking this. I'll bet some of those guys married somebody they wouldn't have married if they hadn't have been living together. Because here's something that just has to be true. This is why this is such a strong theory uh, to test and to think about in this field. All of the things being equal, it has to be harder to break up if you're living together sharing a single address than if you're dating. Uh, and let's take two people that are similarly committed to the future or think they're about as committed to the future and the relationship's progressing. If everything else is identical between two couples or two samples of 10,000 couples, but the 10,000 on the one hand live together and the 10,000 that don't, if they start to figure out some things that aren't so great about the relationship, the 10,000 that are living together are going to have a little harder time getting up and walking away. They got to divide stuff up. They got to separate stuff. They got to decide who paid for what. Somebody's got to move out and find another place. They got to decide how you break up the iPod playlist. I mean, there's a lot of things related to living together that make it harder to break up. But the daters just have to kind of decide we're not doing this anymore. Okay? I'm not saying that that's simple. It can be really difficult and emotionally painful, but it's just a whole different deal than what the cohabitors have to go through. Because they don't have all the legal stuff of marriage and everything else, but in terms of dividing things up, they've got all of that. And increasingly, many children in America, for example, this is, this is like one of the biggest deal demographic changes happening. Uh, many kids born now, uh, in fact, probably most, uh, I'd have to look this up precisely to get it exactly right, but I'm sure if you go under 26, most children born to women in America are not born to married women now. And many of those children are born to, to cohabiting couples. So think about, the, forget the iPod playlist for a second, here's a kid, okay? Uh, and now breaking up means I don't see my kid every day. Uh, this, is iner this is big time inertia. This is our relationship has now acquired a level of mass or force or energy uh, that's really going to make it hard to just get up and go the other way. Uh, it's not impossible. And cohabiting couples break up all the time. They're actually fairly fragile relationships. So not at all impossible. It's just harder than the alternative. It's harder than dating. That's the idea of inertia. Now, inertia has a very straightforward prediction, uh, which is this. Uh, this whole idea of inertia won't be true or shouldn't be true for people who already were certain, and I mean, couples, both are certain together, I want to marry you, I want a future with you. People that have that question nailed before they live together shouldn't be at greater risk because the inertia of cohabiting isn't propelling them on into marriage and into life for a while together. Do you follow that? They've already settled this question before they started cohabiting, so there may be other things that are risky or not for cohabiting, but they don't have this risk because they became very clear and, and often very public about their future together before they made it harder to break up, and that's really the crux of it. Okay? So, uh, the idea, one way to measure this is if you can find samples where you know whether people were engaged or not before they started living together, you can test whether that higher risk group is actually the people that weren't engaged before they start living together. Very straightforward test. And there's a lot of other forms of this test that can be done, but the engagement one's a very strong marker. Part of what makes engagement a very strong marker is it's not only a mutual commitment to the future and that this decision about the future is settled before we're living together, uh, it's public. And there's a great value of public emblems of commitment that goes back to my earlier sort of lament about these things decreasing in the culture. You can't get it wrong about where your partner's at in terms of commitment when it's something that you make very public about planning to be together in the future. Okay, So that's the prediction and we find this to be true 
everywhere we can measure it. Every sample we know of, whether it's the variable, were you engaged or not, before you started living together, we find this. Those who wait till they're married or at least don't cohabit until they're engaged or clearly planning marriage are not at higher risk. Uh, it's the, the group that's at higher risk are the people that are not engaged or planning marriage before they started living together. And that's the group that contains those folks that I'm saying I'm concerned about with inertia, that they're kind of propelled along in life uh, by that living togetherness and the inertia of that, not by having really clarified their dedication to the future together. Now, let's add a little bit onto this and really get to this sliding deciding scheme and, and I'm going to work my way around now to sort of a generic model of how to think about relationship risks uh, that we could really apply to about anything. Uh, two kinds of findings. Um, I love thinking about stuff. I love thinking about relationships. I love looking at my favorite day. This is pretty dorky, but one of my favorite kind of days I can have, work-wise anyway, is uh, nobody calling me, no conference calls, no meetings, in a room by myself with good music playing and data on the computer in front of me thinking about what that means. That's a really good day. Okay. Um, I'm not saying I'm having a bad day with you folks, I'm just saying, you know, that, that's, 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 that's like a really good day. So, uh, one of the things that my life research-wise sometimes entails is going to conferences and either presenting data and findings or being uh, a discussant on other people's data and findings. And I was discussant on a, uh, three papers at a, a conference in 2005 when this phrase sliding versus deciding just crystallized into my head and I can tell you briefly why it crystallized in my head is one uh, a couple of researchers who are colleagues now because uh, we all do research on cohabitation and other things related to relationship uh, Wendy Manning and Pam Smock presented a paper where they had done a qualitative study on cohabiting couples uh, and found that most cohabiting couples couples, just slightly over 50%, um, when asked, how did you start to cohabit, essentially couldn't explain it. They essentially would say, well, we just sort of, well, you know, he was over there three nights a week and then five nights a week and the toothbrush was there and then the lease was up and then we were just sort of living together. Uh, in one way or another, most of the respondents described the process of starting to live, to get, starting to live together as something they slid into. They didn't deliberate about it, they didn't talk about it, they didn't discuss it, they didn't think about what does this mean for you, does this mean we have a future, does this mean we're committed, is this a step we're taking on the way to marriage? You might guess what I think is an important thing for people to do, by the way, if they're going to cohabit, uh, is kind of maybe have that discussion and think about those things. What does this mean? What's this about? Why are we doing this? Because uh, most people don't do that. Uh, and you can imagine that means uh, there's sort of a lot of room for misunderstanding. Uh, a lot of things. And so what Wendy Manning and Pam Smock were essentially saying is most people slide into cohabitation and don't deliberate about it. Uh, ironically, there was another paper there uh, that comes from a real interesting stream of a, a National Science Foundation study by uh, Steve Nock and Laura Sanchez and James Wright on the covenant marriage law in Louisiana where if you were getting married today in Louisiana, you can choose between two levels of marriage. You can choose sort of regular marriage or you can choose high test, uh, which is covenant marriage, which means you're, you're going to do premarital training ahead of time. I mean, you're agreeing to, you're making it harder to get divorced, you're putting in more mechanisms to slow things down. So people can choose, and this is a big study of that. Well, one of the things that they essentially said in their report from this study is that the people choosing covenant marriage, not only were they more religious, that's not exactly a big shock in terms of that result, but essentially one of the really interesting things is what people said over and over again is they were trying to choose a really strong form of commitment in terms of the message it sent to themselves and to the culture about their intention to last through life together. So they wanted that sort of strongest sort of emblem and that's why they chose it. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking they're sort of like hyper deciders. They're really, really deciding, you know, if these people are sliding into a more constrained kind of relationship, 
these people are deciding at a really strong level about what this means and what's this about. And that's where the phrase sliding versus deciding came into my mind the night before this symposium was thinking about those two papers. So let's talk about sliding versus deciding as a generic risk model for relationships. I can't tell you the number of couples I've talked to over the years who got several years into marriage before they figured out one wanted five kids and the other never wanted to see a child again in their life if they could help it. That's kind of a big disconnect, okay? That was like an important piece of information two people named Brad and Jen might have figured out get it right. uh, <laughs> Maybe they'll get another shot here. Uh, you know, I mean, this is like a big disconnect in terms of values, and, and people could figure these things out. Or uh, is this kind of commitment we're developing mutual, or is this just me trying to drag you to the altar, which happens a lot? And then, so we got information, then we make a decision. So we're actually deciding, we're choosing, we're deciding, we're giving up these options to choose these options, and that choosingness conveys or includes this idea that I intend to follow through. And then we go through transitions, okay? So the, the idea here that's lower risk is I get information, I decide about something, and then a transition that is potentially life-altering happens. So what kind of transitions could we be talking about here? Sexual contact. Having sex could say a lot more about that, but I'll just you know move on. Biological attachment, and what I really mean there is uh, something I may say something about before we're done, but just the whole role of oxytocin and other things chemically that relate to how attached these two people are becoming. Uh, the physical relationship will really push that further. Uh, living together having a child together, even becoming married. Uh, the key idea of this transition box for this model is this, and this is why the inertia and constraint box follows it, is that uh, you could probably find exceptions, I mean you certainly could find uh, exceptions where you could say somebody's gone through those transitions and it didn't change them one bit in terms of the rest of their life. But all of these transitions at least have the potential, if not uh, the guarantee, of altering life afterwards in terms of what somebody's options are. Especially having a baby, for example. Uh, cohabiting, maybe, maybe not. Uh, sex, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but lots of times yes, okay? So that the person's options in life aren't the same after they go through whatever the transition we're talking about is. Uh, that they're more constrained in some ways after they've gone through that transition. Here's the way I think we do relationships in America now. I really think this is the fundamental pathway. I don't even know what percent, but I think it's a really big percent. It's not like 55 percent. I think it's pushing 80 or 90 percent in terms of how we do relationships in America now, is we slide through the transition, whoops, or yeah, well, oh, uh, you know, could have varying emotions attached to it. Uh, slide through the transition, get to the constraints, and then get some information about whether that was a good idea or not. <laughs> uh, I'm reminded of a commercial about Las Vegas. Uh, okay, I mean, Las Vegas actually, they could put this chart right up in their commercial. You know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, it's like, what well, well, Las Vegas is actually trying to say uh, in terms of their commercial is the red box doesn't happen to you here, which is not true. Okay, but I mean, there isn't a place where what happens in these very powerful fundamental ways in relationships doesn't affect your future. Uh, they do, or at least they often can affect their future. And the other thing that conspires here in making this pathway risky is speed. Sharon Sassler, sociologist, somebody I uh, talk to fairly often or email fairly often about things because I really like her work studies a lot of the same things that we're talking about here, but really emphasizes and focuses on just the speed at which things happen. Things happen so quickly, and we're so far down the pathway. Uh, one of the other metaphors I like to use when I'm talking to groups of uh, singles, they'll say, look, this is like uh, finding yourself way down a one-way street that turns into a dead-end alley and finding out your reverse gear doesn't work. Okay, We're way far along before we realize, wow, uh, I could have had 
had a V8. Um, and this isn't working so good, and so what am I going to do about it? I've, I've lost a lot of options that might be either irrecoverable or difficult to recover now. Um, let me give you one simple example just on the sexual side. Uh, I think it's 26% in the latest estimate of, uh, by the CDC. Uh, teenage females in America already have or have had an STD. Of course, some of them will have it for the rest of their life, whatever the STD is, okay? That's an unbelievably big percentage of teenage girls in America who already have a somewhat life-altering uh, physical thing because of the transition and the way transitions happen uh, and the way sex happens in relationships. Uh, by the way, I want to notice one other thing that that's I've really enjoyed about this model. If you think about the transition box, we argue endlessly and morally in the culture about what's the proper order of transitions in the transition box. You know, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage, uh, and then comes pain for DA. Uh, <laughs> so, and I do want to say something important about this. Uh, Marlene Pearson and Barbara Defoe Whitehead, who actually is the social historian who wrote the original uh, Dan Quayle Was Right piece that got a lot of play in, I forget, uh, it seems like maybe The Atlantic, uh, I forget what magazine that was in. Uh, they wrote a paper that's actually been picked up by researchers as well, just the, the idea that sequence does matter, that there's things about the kind of classical or traditional sequence that are very protective. Uh, but nobody's naive enough to say that's the way most people are doing relationships now or that's the way most young people are doing relationships now. It's just the people that do kind of stick to that, that sequence do tend to do better in life. Uh, and I think some of this is, is the, the reason. Now, part of what I like about the green box here or the yellow, whatever color that is, to the transitional box here, is while society argues endlessly about the order there and you get into religious arguments and other kinds of things, nobody argues about the horizontal dimension here. There's nothing to argue about. Nobody would say, I think it's great to not get information before you slide through a potentially life-altering transition. I think that's just fine. I think that's a fun way to go through life. Uh, it's worked out well for me. Now, by the way, a lot of people can say it's worked out well for them. They haven't been caught by it. We're talking about probabilities. It's just the probabilities increased that that's not worked out so well. So why is this kind of thing important? S the idea again here is that we slide into something and it's potentially life altering. We have fewer options than we had and the key idea is it would be better to get the most important information about whether that's a good path to be on before we go down that path. Now, let's talk about some of the more uh, unpleasant forms of going down this path. Uh, what's that look like to you? It's boiling something, okay? This is a, this is a, a, a pan of water on our stove at home, okay? Uh, living and being alive and thinking is an endless opportunity for creating metaphors or, or thinking of word pictures for things. Um, Nancy and I, our pattern over the years, if I'm in town, usually I'm waking up the boys, getting them breakfast, she's making them lunch, and I drive them to school. Okay, that's been the pattern unless I'm uh, out traveling somewhere. Uh, and my sons, uh, they go through or they've gone through eras of what they'll eat, uh, especially Luke, Kyle have been a little more flexible in the food pattern thing, uh, but they'll, you know, they'll go through eras and uh, we were in a certain era of breakfast food at this point. Now, here's the thing, what I, 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 look, I saw this pan on the stove and I thought, okay, digital camera time because this is a neat point to make here. Uh, the fact is, you don't really know what's in that pan, do you? And why don't you know what's in that pan? Because of the phone. Now, if you wanted to know what was in that pan, what would you need to do? Take it off the heat or stir it, which either of my scientific sons could explain to you why that's also releasing heat. Uh, somehow you have to just back it off a bit or cool it down a bit. You don't have to like throw a pound of ice in it, right? You just have to cool it down a little bit to see clearly. Now there happens to be, in this case, that's just water boiling with probably about 12 smoky links in it, okay? 
Now you wouldn't know that. Now the point I like to make with young people is this, look when you're going really fast and the hormones are just really cooking and you're all sort of aroused and excited about this person, it's very easy not to see clearly. And you got to back it down a little bit, you got to go a little slower, you got to make it a little less hot or you might not see that you're really in for a very bad time in terms of what's in that pot. That it could be could be a great thing for you, could be a not great thing for you, but the fundamental point of this metaphor is we don't see clearly when we're head over our heels uh, passionate in love. So this is a different sort of passion than what Philippe was talking about earlier. So here's a great way to talk with young people because you're speaking their language when you're talking about this kind of sliding versus deciding idea is really what it amounts to is losing options before you actually made a choice. When we're sliding through things that are potentially life-altering or that constrain us, we're losing our options before we actually chose what we wanted. And that's a very strong way to talk with young people because they're very interested in not losing options. And so if you can convince them by being a little more careful, they can actually have a little better chance of reaching their options, they'll do well in life. Healthy commitment, in contrast, by the way, also involves being constrained. It's just this, you chose the constraints. When it's a healthy commitment, we chose this path over this path. We chose to have limited options because we really wanted to be passionate about this one. This is what we chose to do. This is what we wanted to be. Now, some sliding is fine and good. When nothing's at stake, it's not going to get people in trouble. Deciding matters most. Let's talk about this in the context of a long-term relationship. Uh, when we really want something to stick and to last. And one of the reasons why I think sliding is extra dangerous in relationships that become long-term relationships is they don't strongly set up commitment. The strongest form of commitment will come from a sense that I chose this. I chose you. I chose this path over the other. And then there's all kinds of psychological and other kinds of mechanisms that come into play that help us to really live that out. One other thing on this chart, and then a few other things to talk about before we move on. Uh, sometimes uh, it's worth thinking about this kind of sequence without regard to a particular relationship that's constraining or that limits one's options. That's sort of what the other uh, version of this model is. This one is just, uh, I'm sliding through things. Uh, my future is constrained by things like STDs or multiple sex partners. Uh, the more sex partners people have had before marriage, uh, the, much, the more difficult time they will have uh, in marriage or in life in relationships. Now there's selection in there as well as causal stuff in there just to keep in mind. Multiple partner fertility. This is one of the really biggest things going on now in family demographics is more and more families uh, struggling to make it where this couple is working to, to manage this family as well as children that one or both have from other relationships increasingly very, very prevalent and common. Uh, and nothing about that dooms anybody, it's just more difficult. So uh, it's a good example of sort of uh, my options are a little more constrained because of my past. Um, and the more we constrain our options in terms of what happens in these romantic relationships, uh, the more back to Marlene's idea, your love life is not neutral, it affects all these other kinds of things and options in life. So. Clear decisions anchor commitments and follow through. One of the things that people can do when they really want to pursue something they're passionate about, it's a good choice, it's something I want in my life, is to make pre-commitments. To decide ahead of time before they get into the situations that are more difficult or challenging who they want to be and what they want to do. Pre-commitments are not flawless. How many of you have ever pre-committed not to eat two giant pieces of chocolate cake tonight, okay? Uh, or um, there's, there's certain kinds of candy for me, like once the bag is open, it's done, okay? I mean, there's no way, and if it could be the three ounce bag or the one ounce bag, that bag's not closed until it's gone, no matter what pre-commitment I make. Uh, nevertheless, pre-commitments do make it a little more likely that we can follow through with what we intend. They set up what psychologists call implemental intentions, which do make it more likely we'll pursue something. Now, 
I want to just address for a second here the challenge of the teen brain since that's what you all focus with and you all focus with a lot of very challenging teen brains. Um, I don't need to belabor the point, I can make it really simply, but you all understand well uh, because I know you've thought about it and you talk about it and you think about it, the implications of the prefrontal cortex in terms of how teenagers do in life. So that's that blue part there, right? That blue part of the brain is very involved in planning and the ability to focus on long-term versus short-term goals, long-term versus short-term gratification. It's the executive part of the brain that makes decisions. So so it is the decider, okay? It's the part of the brain that says, we're not sliding, we made a decision, we're following through with it. That's the decider part of the brain. It's the self-control and the control of proper behavior part of the brain, okay? Now, there's really fascinating studies. Some of you uh, know about this or have read about this or heard about this. There's really amazing studies been going on that show that the front part of the brain or this function in our minds gets tired when we have to make a lot of decisions, when we have to really work to keep it together. Uh, it gets harder to do that in the next thing we do in life. It gets worn out and there's a lot of ingenious experiments that show that this is a, a the way they put it, self-control is a limited resource. We use it up. And one of the things that I've been trying to impress upon with people is that has a very interesting implication for our likelihood of sticking with what we really mean to do and what we really want to do in life. So if I've decided this is important to me, I want to do X. That could be a career goal, an educational goal, a personal health goal, or a relationship goal. If I've decided that, I've made that commitment, maybe it's within myself, maybe I've made it publicly. Public commitments have a little more force. Uh, that's why New Year's resolutions for some people work. Uh, for many people they don't, but, but that's another discussion. Um, I made this commitment uh, if I am working really hard or even getting burned out or getting overtired in what I'm doing here, my self-control in the next frame isn't going to be as good in terms of sticking to a pre-commitment that I've made. So I like to think of this in terms of like a comic strip. Imagine a comic strip that you might see in the paper and it has frames. Many of them have three frames. There's this, there's this, and then there's this. This is a two-frame comic strip. And what I like people to think about is the fact that if we're doing something in this first frame that is wearing on the prefrontal cortex, it's demanding a lot from us in terms of deciding, keeping it together, thinking, working, etc. It's very easy to let down in the next frame. So from the teen student perspective, for example, you got a student, let's say a really good student or one that struggles but wants to be a good student, so has been working really hard, thinking a lot, studying a lot, really working through that test on that day in your class. That night, they may have a lot more risk of a letdown than on the average day because they have worn out their decider. They have been wearing out the part of their brain that teens already aren't strong in, right? Do uh, you know what age this part of your brain is like fully available and online to do this task? It's about 25, yeah, 25 and up or so. So teens have this 12 year period of time where this part of the brain that's most fundamentally involved in self-control and sticking to what you meant to do doesn't work so well or doesn't work as well as it's eventually going to well. Uh, that doesn't mean we just give up on them, doesn't mean we say it's all hopeless, but we can help them understand that sliding is risky in life. Uh, the way to get what you really want in life is to decide and to make commitments to those things, not necessarily to be rigid because who wants a 15 year old committing rigidly to a career path, for example. I mean, they may find they hate that kind of course once they get into college, which should be a clue. Maybe I'd hate this kind of work once I get out of college. So people could overcommit. With teenagers, we're looking for smaller, shorter term commitments about who they want to be and what they want to do that keep them out of trouble now. Pre commitments improve their odds. They don't guarantee that things will go well. And we can help them understand that when you're really working in one phase of life to keep it together, you got to watch extra hard for the letdown in the next frame because that's a time of high risk. Thank you very much.